always for the invitation to come here today and it's been a pleasure to take part in this great conference really. And uh, I'm also here as a representative of Genesis, the Swedish creationist organization. I'm part of the board of Genesis, so I want to send my greetings to all of you from the members of Genesis. And, and I, I think it's very good to have this kind of cooperation and, 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 and visit each, each other's conferences. And uh, could I just start with a short prayer? Yes. Uh, dear Father in heaven, I pray that you lead me now when I go giving this talk so that it, it will mean something for those that listen. Lead me with your precious, with your precious Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So, uh, uh, before I start the talk, let let me just mention a little bit about uh, Genesis, the Swedish creationist organization. So, um, it has it was founded more than forty years ago, but uh, uh, the current name Genesis came about in the mid nineties, and. Uh, we have about 260 members. We have an annual conference in October each year. And then we have, I brought some copies of our magazine so they, that we, you can, you're free to take any, uh, any of these uh, and, and I will leave them. They are in Swedish, but maybe <laughs> you can use Google Translate or maybe some of you know Swedish. Uh, Frank, you can read yes. Swedish, yes. Okay. Uh, so here are some uh, copies of, of, of Genesis. Usually, we have a theme for each for, for 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 each new version of the magazine, and it has four issues a year, and about one thousand subscriptions. And we have some other activities. We have a pod, a newsletter, we have a YouTube channel, uh, and the web page where, where we also have a web shop and. We also try to reach out in, in, in various ways, uh, writing newspaper articles and lectures at churches, sometimes at schools. And uh, apart from Genesis, I also wanted to take the opportunity to inform you about this book. And it will, came out, it will come out, uh, it will be published in two weeks, 15th of April approximately. And I'm very happy that me and Samuel Lampa, we are both members of the board of, of Genesis. We are the editors of a book entitled Biblical Creation on Solid Ground. So in this book we want to sort of look at biblical creation from many perspectives. Theology, uh, why uh, uh, is it important or why uh, is it very helpful to have a historical, literal interpretation of the first 11 chapters of the Bible. Philosophy, uh, uh, can we argue that it, it is science to have such a, such a, a viewpoint? Uh, and also natural sciences, biology, physics, uh, geology, and so on. And we, we have a foreword by Frank Carlson, uh, Frank Carlson and Jonathan Sarfati. And then we have, I'm, I'm very happy that we have many well-known contributors to this book. So myself and uh, uh, Samuel Lampa, we have written the introductory chapter. Then Anders Gerdmar, he's president of uh, the Scandinavian School of Theology. This is a theological school in Uppsala. I'm part of the, I'm part of the uh, board of that school. He has written a, a chapter on theology. Then, I've written a chapter on philosophy of science. I argue that it is, in fact, a science to, to, to have the biblical creation approach, as long as you formulate testable hypotheses. Russell Humphreys has written a chapter on cosmology, Andy McIntosh on thermodynamics and information. Stuart Burgess has written a, 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 an article, a, a chapter on intelligent design of animal joints. Tasma Walker a chapter on geology and fossils, Jeffrey Tompkins, a chapter on creative kinds and phenomenology, Brian Thomas, a chapter on paleoanthropology, Robert Carter, a chapter on genetics and human uniqueness that we all originate from Adam and Eve, and uh, Nathaniel Jason has written a chapter on genetics and human history. Um, and uh, he sort of gives a summary of his recent book, Traced, in, in, in that chapter. And, and this book is published by 
uh, Scandinavian School of Theology, uh, which I mentioned about. And uh, this is a theological school that uh, uh, tries to have the Bible, the view of the Bible as a word of God, as a foundation. And uh, um, it doesn't get any support from the state. Uh, uh, but uh, on the other hand, then we are more free to offer courses on various uh, uh, topics. So uh, this school has offered theology courses for quite many years. But starting this spring, we will also start to offer courses in other subjects, but with a biblical foundation. And so I will teach myself a course on on biblical creation based on this book I mentioned that will come out in two weeks. We will also have other uh, courses on pedagogy, on uh, uh, history of science, literature, uh, and things like that with a biblical foundation. Uh, and, and I think it, this is well connected with uh, truth and transformation and the third revolution ideas that Frank mentioned about earlier. To, to letting, having the church, letting the church have an impact on, on education and, and getting education back to the church, so to speak. So this was some introduction. Uh, so now let me now get back to my talk. So I, I, I'm a mathematician, statistician. So I sort of have an outside perspective from biology. But I, I have cooperated with geneticists for and biologists for quite many years on statistical genetics, population genetics, and more recently, questions about information uh, in, uh, uh, relating to biology. And that brings me to that paper you referred to, Boris, that I will come back to, a paper that was published three years ago together with Steinar Thorvaldsen. So let me give an outline of the talk. I will start just to address first, what is fine-tuning? And then I will give some brief history of fine-tuning. Then I will give some examples of fine-tuning in molecular, molecular biology, proteins, molecular machines, cellular networks. We have, had, had, we have heard several great talks on this topic uh, today. So I will only uh, sort of describe the biology very briefly. Uh, but I will send, try to formulate this mathematically. Uh, a mathematical definition of fine-tuning and I will try to use the same definition to make the point that proteins, molecular machines are fine-tuned and also a population that is biologically fit uh, that it is fine-tuned. I will come back to that and then we'll, I will also talk about Van Gitt's five level of information. Uh, Van Gitt wrote a very uh, important book 20 years ago, in the beginning was information. I will talk about how we can sort of uh, couple his ideas to fine-tuning. And then at the end I will also talk about functional and actual, uh, active information. These are concepts as a measure that something is not random. There is an outward intelligence that has must have brought in knowledge into the algorithm. So active information is the amount of uh, external intelligence that has to be brought in in order to explain that something is fine-tuned. And then I will end with uh, some conclusions. So that's the outline. So let me very briefly talk about fine-tuning. So here we see a panel with lots of knob, uh, knobs and we have a music technician that need to adjust all those knobs in order for perfect sound to appear. So if, we, if the standings of all these knobs is some feature X, we could generalize this, that an object is fine-tuned if its properties, and in this case the properties, the perfect sound, depend sensitively on some features. All the knobs have to be adjusted correctly in order for it to function, to have perfect sound. But we could also give other examples of fine-tuning. A car needs all the parts uh, correctly assembled in order to function. Uh, we cannot uh, sort of uh, rep uh, we cannot switch the brakes and the engine and so on. They need to be put in the correct positions. But the universe itself is also fine-tuned uh, because it, 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 it's laws of nature, constants of nature, 
and how the universe looked when it was young, the initial conditions, they also need to be, have precise values for life to exist. And we also had heard a great talk yesterday by Boris on photosynthesis, uh, and that's, a, uh, that's also a mechanism that also need to be fine-tuned. So when uh, water and, and uh, carbon dioxide and light is, is uh, transferred into sugar and oxygen using chlorophyll uh, uh, to help that uh, react into the reaction, to catalyze it. So that's another example that uh, the chlorophyll and this whole process need to be fine-tuned in order to, to work. And we had heard yesterday the details of, of, of this fine-tuning. Uh, but we can also address what is the relation between fine-tuning, the designer and God. It's sort of three levels of, 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 of uh, addressing this question. So a fine-tuned object is designed if it's brought about by an intelligent mind for a specific purpose according to a plan. So that means that design goes beyond fine-tuning and it also answers the question what causes the fine-tuning. There is someone who had a plan to bring about the object that is fine-tuned. Fine-tuning is more an observation. We don't address who caused fine-tuning. So uh, in my three examples, the car is designed by a human engineer, whereas the universe and the photosynthesis, well, then we think of God as the designer. And then creationism goes one step further, uh, and it goes beyond design and postulates the identity of this designer, that is God. And then uh, this brings us to the question, when should we talk about fine-tuning, when should we talk about design, and when should we talk about God? Well, I, 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 uh, I, I like the most to, to, to talk about God and creationism, but maybe in some, some uh, it depends on the audience, and it, it, sometimes it also depends on the problem I'm talking about. And, uh, and that brings us to the question, when can we talk about uh, something at these three levels in academia? We know that uh, academia is quite secular, it's dominated by a view that by f philosophers is uh, described as methodological naturalism. That m doesn't mean that you have to be an atheist in order to adopt that view. It only means that only natural explanations are allowed in science. And there are many Christians who think that science should be like this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and then, if you have this view, then you rule out intelligent design and creationism for, from start. But it, it's sort of not always the case that, uh, I mean, this view is prevailing, but th there are some exceptions. Um, and we can think of three levels of creation-inspired research and, uh, and uh, using either of these three levels, uh, we could, uh, if we talk about fine-tuning, highly specified conditions in physics or biology are needed for life to exist, then the allowed audience in academia is still quite large, especially in physics, because fine-tuning has been a concept that has sort of been discussed for many decades. In, uh, in biology, it's, it's uh, more sensitive, but it, 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 it's still allowed in some contexts. If you go to the second level, the allowed audience is, uh, shrinks considerably because intelligent design is often regarded as a pure pseudoscience. And if you go to the third level, the audience, allowed audience shrinks even more. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should bring about the message. It, it, uh, and, and I think Frank's talk was very inspiring in this context. Um, but I, I, I and, and, and this brings me to this paper that you mentioned about Boris, that I published two, three years ago with uh, Steinar Torvaldsson. He's a professor of, of informatics at, in, in Norway. And this is an article on fine-tuning in biology. And, and we mostly, it's entitled Using Statistical Methods to Model Fine-Tuning of Molecular Machines and Systems. 
And we mostly talk about fine tuning, that's level one. But we also, at the end of the article, we, mes meant we talk a little bit about intelligent design uh, in a quite positive way. And I was actually surprised myself that this paper was published by the Journal of Theoretical Biology. Uh, and uh, it was actually the most downloaded paper of that journal, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was uh, a really a surprise for me. And there were some positive comments, but also many very negative comments. And I think the editors were put on a lot of pressure to withdraw the paper, but uh, uh, I'm very happy they did not. I think they showed a lot of courage, but they did write a disclaimer that uh, we, 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 we do not at all adhere to the theory of intelligent design or creationism and things like that. But the, the paper remains, and maybe, maybe the disclaimer helped us to uh, advertise the paper. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 so let me give some uh, history of, of, of uh, fine tuning. Uh, so, as I said, fine tuning is close to design, although design also uh, reveals the identity of, of uh, what is the cause of the fine tuning and who is behind fine tuning. <coughs> and the design argument is very old. The antique Greeks talked about, Aristotle and others talked about uh, design. We have from the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquin and others had design arguments. We have William Paley's famous design uh, argument, the clockmaker uh, uh, analogy. But the history of fine tuning, when you use more arguments from science, from natural sciences, is more recent. Uh, and uh, uh, an important book was written by the American. Uh, um, biologist uh, and physiologist Henderson and he in this book he emphasized the significance of water carbon and other environmental conditions for life on earth and then uh, in the 70s the Australian cosmologist Brandon Carter he, he he wrote an article and introduced the concept the anthropic principle saying that uh, uh, the universe is constructed in such a way that it's very fav favorable for humans. And in the, in the late 80s, Barrow and Tipler uh, wrote a thick book where they expanded this argument and, list and, 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 and presented a long list of parameters that need to be fine-tuned in order for, li for life to exist. And the recent overview of fine-tuning in cosmology uh, is given in the book by Lewis and Barnes from 2016. So we see that fine tuning in uh, on the sort of macroscopic level on the Earth and in the whole universe is quite old. It's more recent in molecular biology, quite naturally, because the, uh, the development in molecular biology it, it took off in the 50s uh, after. Watson and Crick's discovery of the structure of DNA and other research, uh, but it also because it has been more sensitive to talk about fine-tuning within biology. There, there, there was a famous book published in the 80s by Thaxton et al. Life, uh, about life's origin, and in particular they talked about the cell and that it point, the information in the cell points towards a designer. This book was very important for the birth of the intelligent design movement in the late 80s. I think it was very important for Steve Meyer, Stephen Meyer, for instance. And then a de decade later, we have Michael B's book, Darwin's Black book Box, where he introduced the concept of irreducible complexity, where the system is irreducibly complex in, in, uh, if it needs all its parts in order to function. And he gave several examples of that. And you can also say that this is a modern version of William Paley's, Paley's uh, uh, clockmaker analogy. And then fine-tuning and mathematics. In 1998, William Dembski introduced the concept of specified complexity. And I will come back to that because we will build on that concept when we try to formulate uh, uh, fine-tuning mathematically. Before I do that, let me just give some examples of fine-tuning in molecular biology. 
So, a protein, uh, a functioning protein, well, that is a, a highly specified amino acid sequence. It has to have the amino acids have to come in a certain order in order for this uh, sequence to fold into a functioning <coughs> protein that does its job somewhere in the cell. But then we can also go to the next level of the hierarchy and look at a system of molecules. It could be a system of proteins uh, or other molecules that uh, together form a molecular machine. And, and for this machine to work, not only must the different parts, that could be proteins for instance, not only must they be correct, but they must also be positioned correctly in relation to each other. So, and that, that I will come back to that, arguing that that makes the fine tuning even larger because it's at the next level of hierarchy of fine tuning. And then we could go up to uh, the next, even uh, to the third level, cellular networks that are sort of networks of molecular machines or protein complexes involved in various processes in the cell. And I think uh, Boris. Your, your, your talk yesterday, you talked about photosynthesis, but you also talked about other processes that you, uh, that you need them both. Uh, uh, various processes, uh, uh, various, various uh, processes of metabolism and, and that sort of protects the cell from oxygen and so on. And I think that is going above molecular machines. To, to, to a higher level and, and also Frank Carlson, your talk today, you, you sort of went up to an even higher level in the hierarchy. So sort of, you could say, uh, uh, systems of, of, of cellular networks and so on. So, so uh, the higher up you go, the, uh, the more, I will argue that the more fine tuning you have, but I, I will come back to that. So that brings us to a more strict definition of fine tuning. And uh, I will say that a, a structure, and, and this is the de definition we have in this paper, with, uh, the, which I co-published with Steina Thorvaldsen. A structure X, X is fine-tuned if it is complex, and that means that it's a, a very unlikely that this structure occurred by chance. And the second requirement is that it has an independent specification something that you recognize, it could be that something functions, it could be that there is a code involved, you recognize something, code uh, that uh, uh, sort of uh, brings our minds to intelligence, it could be a message, a meaning, and so on. Some, something that we recognize, a specification. And this is essentially William Dembski's definition of specified complexity. And in order now to turn this into a more strict mathematical definition, we must define what do we mean by chance in the first part A, and what do we mean by specificity in the second part. And that, will de that, is, con that is context de dependent, what we mean by specificity. So let me now give this mathematical definition of fine tuning. We start to present a set omega of all possible structures. I, now, often omega is extremely high dimensional. It could be the all possible amino acid sequences of a certain length. But uh, here I've drawn it as a one dimensional set. And then I introduce something that I uh, refer to as a specificity function. So for each possible structure, we give a number, call it f of x, which tells how specified that structure is. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then in the third step we say, yeah, well, now we observe a certain structure. It could be a protein that functions. And then we know that, well, we have this specificity function. We know how specified it is. Then we introduce the set A of all structures that are at least as specified as the one we observe. So this is a set of very specified states. And then we need to uh, talk about randomness. What do we need by randomness? Well, we have to have some distribution. If we generate the structure randomly, 
uh, how is it distributed? So we need to have that in place also. Uh, and then we say that an object is fine-tuned if the P of A, that is the probability of having the set A by chance. So that is the probability of, ha of having a structure which is at least as fine-tuned as the one we observe by chance. If that probability is small, then the structure is fine-tuned. And this probability can be, distribution can be defined in various ways. The most natural one is say that if we choose something by chance, well then it has a uniform distribution. All possible structures in the set omega are equally likely. Uh, we can also illustrate this, instead of omega being one-dimensional, let it be two-dimensional instead. And then we have... Here we have the observed structure somewhere, x-ops. And then the set A here, the colored set, the red set. This is now uh, the set of states which are at least as specified as the observed one. And then in this case, uh, the object x-ops is fine-tuned if the area of the red ellipse is very small in comparison to the area of the whole rectangle omega. So, so if this uh, region here is very small, then the object is fine-tuned, because then it's difficult, very difficult to obtain it by chance. And now we will apply this uh, uh, we will apply this definition to a number of uh, uh, features like proteins, molecular machines and, 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 and other things. But before we do this, let me just get back to, the, to Dembski's definition and see that our extension is, 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 uh, uh, is in agreement with his definition. So, according to uh, specified complexity, an object is fine-tuned if it is complex that is, it is very difficult for it to occur by chance. And sec the second requirement was that it has an independent specification, something we recognize. Uh, now, let's get back to the mathematical definition. We had something, xops, that was the observed structure. We say that it's fine-tuned if we had this set A of, of, of structures that are at least as fine-tuned as XOPS. If it's very unlikely to reach A by chance, to bring about A by chance, then the, the structure is fine-tuned. And I would say that this is consistent with the definition of specified complexity A and B, because XOPS is complex, that is condition A, since it is difficult to obtain it by chance, because we said here that the probability of the set A was small. So the first condition A is satisfied. The second one, B, is also satisfied, because uh, uh, um, A consists of the highly specified states. And that means that XOPS is served itself is, is, is specified. So, so if the probability of A is small, uh, it's di uh, then it's difficult to reach XOPS by chance, <coughs> condition A, and uh, the set A consists of the set of highly specified states, that is condition B. So what we have done here, you, could see, you can view upon it as a, as a mathematical formalization of, 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 of the concept of specified complexity. Let's now apply this to proteins. So, we will ask the question, is an amino acid sequence of a certain length, L, that folds to a functioning protein? So we know that this amino acid folds to a functioning protein. Is it fine-tuned? So let's now apply this mathematical definition of fine-tuning in order to answer this question. So that means that we need this space, omega. So now, we have 20 amino acid sequences, so we have a sequence of length L, could be one, 150, 300 and so on, and we have a letter written on a 20, we have a 
uh, we have text written on, with a 20 letter alphabet. So there are 20 to L, 20 times itself L times possibilities, an enormous amount of possible sequences of that length. And then we need to specificity function. So in this case, we simply say that there are two possibilities. Either the sequence X folds to a functioning protein that gives us a one, it, it, it functions, or it does not, then F has a value zero. So that is the simplest choice of specificity function. And then we have this observed sequence, uh, X ops with uh, L amino acids. So I have illustrated the first two amino acids here. Uh, and we know that this particular amino acid sequence is one of many possible amino acid sequences in the set omega. But this particular one, the observed one, it does fold to a functioning protein. So, so F of X ops is one. And we want to know, we want to find out whether uh, this particular sequence, amino acid sequence, is fine-tuned. And this requires now three steps. We'll use this mathematical definition. It, it involves three steps. First, we need to find the set A. And remember, the set A was the set of all structures that are at least as specified as the one we observed. In this case, f had two possible values, 0 and 1. The observed structure ha had a 1. It functions. It is amino acid sequence that folds to a functioning protein. That means that we have a 1 here, and f can only take the values of 0 and 1. So the set A is simply the set of amino acid sequences that, that fold to a functioning protein. And then uh, molecular biologists have found A empirically in certain contexts. So you can actually find uh, the set A. The set, or, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's not possible to go through all 20 to L possible amino acid sequences, but you could have some uh, sort of arguments uh, to argue that a, a certain set A is a set of... Uh, amino acid sequences that fold to a functioning protein, then we need to find the distribution P. What, does, what do we mean by a random amino acid sequence? Well, the simplest choice is that pick all amino acids randomly, and there are 20 of them, so the probability of picking a certain amino acid at each position is 1 over 20, and then you just multiply these probabilities. But then an evolutionary biologist might question that uh, and say that, well, we think that some chemical evolutionary process brought about this functioning protein and that it will not have that distribution. So then you could create some uh, population genetic model for how a uh, chemical evolution of this particular protein is supposed to work, but that simply defines some other probability on how, how did this come about, how did this come about by chance? And then the, having uh, chosen this, uh, um, what we mean by random, then we can compute the probability of having a functioning protein. And we say that the amino acid sequence is fine-tuned if, if it's very unlikely to bring about a functioning protein by chance. The probability of the set A is small. And, uh, and we heard a, a talk previous today about Douglas X experiments in the, in, in the early 2000s for amino acid sequences of like 150. He estimated that the probability of having a functioning protein is a lot smaller than 10 to minus 50. I think he used this first definition of randomness, but I, I, I strongly believe that you will still have a very small probability even if you had this as an outcome of a chemical evolutionary process. Of course, it depends on the parameters you have in, in, in that evolutionary process. Uh, so, uh, but in a, so if, you, if we use Douglas X result, the probability to bring about a functioning, to have a functioning protein for an amino acid sequence of length 150 is less than 10 to minus 50. And this is a very small number. So we conclude that 
this uh, amino acid sequence that we observe that folds to a functioning protein, it is indeed fine-tuned. So that was uh, fine-tuning for proteins using this mathematical definition. Let's now go to the next level of the hierarchy. Let's look at molecular machines. And there are several of them in the cell. We have the ribosomes in the cell plasma that synthes synthesize proteins using uh, messenger RNA as a template in order to construct, uh, to, to synthesize an uh, amino acid sequence. And here we see the two major subunits of a ribosome. Each, each subunit consists of a number of proteins and, and RNA molecules that need to be put together in the correct way. The second example is uh, the bacterial flagellum of, of mummy bacteria. We know that uh, this uh, flagellum it extends over the cell wall or, or uh, uh, here, here we have the, the, the cell wall of, of, or cell membrane of the bacterium. Inside we have a, a circular motor, a rotor with different parts and here we have a, a hook and a filament outside the cell wall that makes it possible th for the bacterium uh, uh, the, the bacterium to swim and we, all these parts need to be put together in the correct way and, uh, and, and uh, uh, positioned relative to each other in the correct way and then we have ATP synthase uh, that is located within the mitochondrial uh, within the mitochondria in the cell plasma so it extends over the, uh, the inner membrane of mitochondria and it, 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 it sort of functions a bit similar to the flagellum. It has a circular motor inside of the inner membrane and then it, it has an upper part that goes up within the inner membrane of the, of the, of the, uh, of the mitochondrion. And it also has a number of different parts that need to function and we need to be assembled correctly in order for ATP synthase as a whole, the whole machine to function. So these are just three different examples of molecular machines in the cell. You have many others. So we could say that a molecular machine in general consists of N building blocks, molecules, and uh, each of them need to have at least three th things. They need to have the correct structure. So each part, each molecule needs to be correct. Uh, so for, for, for a protein that needs to be an, an amino acid sequence that's folded to a functioning protein. We already looked at fine tuning at that le lower level of, of the hierarchy. Secondly, each part needs to be located correctly and they also need to be configured correctly, rotated relative to its neighbors with contact topology and all things that, like that in order for the whole system to function. So now we will uh, ask a question, how do we find out whether a molecular machine is fine-tuned? And then we will again formulate the problem mathematically. And I will sort of, I, I mean, intuitively it's quite clear that a molecular machine needs to be more fine-tuned than the, its parts. But I will simply verify this mathematically, you could say. So, so it, it's intuitively quite clear. Uh, so, but now we will formulate this mathematically. So we first need the set of all possible uh, collections of molecules. Most of them will not work, but we need to define all the set of possible molecules. So this is our set omega. I will illustrate this with a bacterial flagellum here. So it has n parts. Each part needs a has a structure, location and configuration in relation to its uh, neighbors. Uh, so, so if x1, if one is uh, uh, the filament here, uh, so then the, the filament needs uh, uh, has a structure, location and configuration. 
The second part here is, is a junction. It, it has a certain structure, location, and configuration. Then we can go through all the parts of the of the uh, of the motor here, the rotor, with inside the cell membrane, and so on. So all the parts needs has a structure, location, and configuration. And then we use the same specificity function as for proteins. It takes on two values. So this collection of n molecules. It corresponds to a functioning molecular machine. Well, then f of x is 1. If it does not correspond to a functional molecular, functioning molecular machine, then f of x is 0. So f it can take on two values in this case, as in the previous example. Now, suppose that x ops is a molecule, molecular machine that functions. We want to find out whether that molecular machine is functioning. The, uh, is fine-tuned and as for proteins we will check this with a mathematical definition and this requires the same three steps that we went through with proteins the first step is we, we need to find this set A of states that are at least as specified as the one we observe but we, we, we assume that we observe a collection of molecules that when put together becomes a functioning molecular machine. And we have the same specificity function, either 0 or 1. And since the observed structure had value 1, again, the set A is simply the set of all collections of n molecules that correspond to a functioning molecular machine. So that is the first step. The second step, we need to... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. It, before going to the second step, I will I will specify this. I, I will describe this set in more detail using an ID from William Dembski. Uh, now, suppose this uh, molecular machine is irreducibly complex. That means that all its parts must function in order for it to function. And. Uh, and that means that all its parts need to have the correct structure. That means that the structure needs to belong to a set AN, which is the set of allowable structures for component N. Then, uh, the, and then component N needs to have the correct location. So, so XN of L needs to belong to the set of allowable lo locations for component N. And then uh, all parts need to have the correct <coughs> configuration. So Xn of C, that is the configuration of part N, needs to belong to the set A and of C of allowable configurations. And this we go through for all parts of the molecular machine. So that for the filament, the junction, and so on, for all parts of the rotor, and so on. So that was the first step. Now we have defined the set A. So A consists of all these other sets because we need to uh, we, we need to have all the parts need to have the correct structure, location, and configuration. Then we need to define what what does randomness mean? Uh, and, and we say that suppose we choose structure, location, and configuration independently for all molecules. So that's a simple way of, of defining randomness. And we think that we already have defined what randomness means for each part. Uh, and then the third step is compute the probability of have of the of, of what is the probability of, that we have by chance uh, col that a collection of n molecules corresponds to a functioning molecular machine. And now we said in step two that stru uh, that uh, structure, location, and configuration is independent between all the parts. That means that we simply multiply the probabilities over all n capital N molecules. And for each part of molecule, we needed correct structure, location, and configuration. So we need to multiply three probabilities here as well. And we will see this is the key why a molecular machine, which is the second hierarchy, is more fine-tuned than each part itself because we multiply together probabilities from the first level of hi hierarchy. So if you have a molecular machine that consists of a number of proteins, each of these factors are small, because 
the probability is small that an amino acid sequence uh, folds to component one. Another amino sequence should fold to component two. We already said that <coughs> each of those forms are fine-tuned, and now we multiply together a number of such probabilities that then the probability of the whole system of n parts will be, be even smaller. Uh, so this leads us to the following conclusion. Suppose all, all n parts of an irreducibly complex molecular machine are fine-tuned. That means that all these factors are small. So let's go back to all these factors are small. The probability of having the correct structure for all the n molecules, um, the filament, the junction, and so on, of the bacterial flagellum. Then we also have these problems. So I, I, need, I don't need to take this into account in the argument on the next slide. Uh, uh, so we have the probabilities all parts having the correct structures are small because all parts are fine-tuned. Then the molecular machine itself has an even smaller probability of occurring by chance because we need all the parts to be correct but we, also, but we need all the parts to be correct. And then they also need to be positioned correctly and, 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 and be configured correctly. So, so the conclusion is that the molecular machine is even more fine-tuned than uh, its parts. Uh, so an irreducibly complex molecular machine with fine-tuned parts <coughs> is even more fine-tuned itself than its parts. So, so that was uh, my two examples from molecular biology. Proteins are fine-tuned and the molecular machines. We could go to the next hierarchy and look at cellular networks, collections of molecular machines, but it, it will be even more fine-tuned, so to speak. So instead of doing that, now I will give you a totally different uh, illustration of this concept of mathematically uh, sort of describing what fine-tuning is. So I will look at evolutionary trajectories. And what do I mean by this? Here we see uh, an evolu two evolutionary trajectories. So on the vert on the along the horizontal axis we have time. So during so capital T is the present, and then we think of a, a population that has a certain history. It started at time zero, and on the vertical axis we have average fitness. Uh, and uh, so in fitness in population genetics is usually the average number of offspring. For, for, for each generation. So the more, so a, a threatened species, which, which is sort of have like breeding depression or something, has a usually low fitness. Because you might have many deleterious mutations in the past that lowered the, the viability of the population. Here we have two possible trajectories. The X trajectory with increasing fitness over time. The X prime trajectory with decreasing fitness over time. So, so, so these are two. So now x is 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 a function. The structure is a function. What is now the specificity function? Well, the specificity function is the population's fitness today. So the x prime curve, which which has a decreasing fitness over time, it f of x prime is this value. It is the fitness today, whereas the other population with, which had increasing fitness over time, then f of x is this higher fitness. So now we will have, suppose now we have a certain species alive today, it has a certain average fitness, uh, f ops, and we want to know whether this is something that is fine tuned or not. And uh, so we want to observe, observe whether the observed fi uh, fitness of a certain species today is fine-tuned. And again, now we will apply this mathematical definition of fine-tuning to answer this question. And it, it requires these three steps I mentioned about earlier. The first step is to find the set A of, and remember, A is the set of all possible outcomes that are at least as specified as the one we observe. But for this particular example, 
the specificity function was the fitness observed today. And we have f of is this dashed curve here, up here. So that means if we, if we say, assume that a population start in the past with this fitness, then uh, x prime does not belong to the set A because it ends with a fitness which is much lower than what we observed for this species. Whereas x belongs to the set A because it ends up here. Uh, so, and we, then we realize that the set A is a set, uh, the set of all evolutionary paths that end with a fitness above the observed one. So, that, so now we have found the set A. The second step is to find the distribution of a randomly chosen trajectory. And that's an object of population genetics that we need to, we, 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 we think of uh, an evolutionary process that we have uh, mutations occurring, we have a uh, natural selection of, uh, operating on mutations, we have genetic drift, random ch changes from generation to generation. So we, we need to specify this and the evolutionary process is our uh, randomness mechanism here. And it, you, will, you will find out that it's extremely important how we define the evolutionary process. I will come back to this next slide. And then we compute the probability of the set A and that is the probability that evolution by chance generates a population that is at least as fit as, as the one we observe today. So if we start here, what is the probability that the evolutionary process by chance have a, has an increasing fitness and ends up above the f ops dashed line here? Uh, so, uh, and, and, uh, and that brings us to the question, is a population fine-tuned? So, given a certain population with observed, certain observed fitness, uh, the key question is, if this probability p of a is small, how, how large is the probability that evolution by chance generates a trajectory that ends up above f ops? That depends on, as I said, the properties of the evolutionary process, types of mutations, and also how long time uh, evolution had to act. And then that brings us to Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. And uh, the, this was a famous theorem formulated, I think, in the early 1930s. It was based on the assumption that mutations are uh, average or neutral, uh, on, on, on average or neutral. And it was a beautiful mathematical result, but it leads to the conclusion that most tra trajectories have increasing fitness over time. And then the probability of A is large and the observed fitness today is not fine-tuned. And I think this result had a large importance for the modern synthesis of the 40s and 50s because you know that that was when evolutionary theory was sort of brought together with genetics. When at Darwin's time, um, uh, evolution, uh, there was no known mechanism of evolution. But then uh, genetics, uh, uh, Mendel's theories of genetics were rediscovered in the early 20th century. And then population geneticists used that concept a few decades let, uh, later and, and suggested that yes, uh, natural selection acting on mutations, that is a genetic mechanism of evolution. And I think Fisher's uh, fundamental theory of natural se selection in particular had a great impact so that biologists they, they, they were really convinced by these arguments and said that now we have the mechanism for evolution and so and that was the modern synthesis, neo-Darwinism it was born in the 40s or 50s and then it was like then evolutionary theory became sort of an established science but the question is this is a key assumption Mutations are on average neutral. Because John uh, Bassner and Sanford, they published a generalization of, fit, uh, of Fish, Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. They changed that assumption to a more realistic one, where most mutations are slightly deleterious. And then it turns out that on average, 
the population's fitness is declining. And that means that the probability to reach, if we start down here, the probability is very small that we, uh, that we end up above FOPS. So then the probability becomes very small, at, at least of if, if the time is large. So uh, using this result, time becomes the enemy of evolutionary theory. Because the longer time we have, and this is John Sanford's genetic entropy argument, the smaller the set probability P of A. And the more fine-tuned the observed structure, the, the observed fitness of the population we see today is. And this is simply because our genomes are eroding over time. Natural selection cannot cope, it cannot remove all the deleterious mutations, and then the average fitness is declining over time. So if, as uh, evolutionary biologists claim that uh, uh, our ancestry is old, well, then th that means even more that it, evolution cannot have happened by chance because of this result. So, so that was, let's now go to a totally different uh, application. Uh, Verne Gitt, he, he published a book uh, about 20 years ago. In the beginning was information. I think it was a very important book about our understanding of information. Uh, because uh, Claude Shannon has formulated a mathematical theory um, of information theory in the 1940s, which was extremely important for communication and so on, but it did not address concepts of meaning and, and, and things like that. And, and, and uh, sort of Van Gitt and others extended the notion of information to also bring in meaning and other things. And he ended up with five levels of information for a piece of text. The lowest level is that, that is Shannon's idea of information. Something is complicated, it is complex, that means that it's difficult to generate it by chance. Uh, but it doesn't address the concept whether there is, it is a meaningful sentence or not. The next level of the hierarchy is that the sentence has a correct syntax or code according to a certain language. We can sort of understand the individual words. The next level is that it also means something. To a, a, a sender transmits a message to a receiver and the text means something. The next level is even more. It not only means something, but the sender wants the receiver to act in a certain way. And then the fourth level is that, yes, but not only the sender wants the receiver to act, the, 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 the sender also has a certain purpose uh, with uh, the message. So we here now we will introduce again how we bring in the specificity function. So we say that uh, we have five level we, we have five possible values of the specificity function. So level zero we could also say that that is a complexity level. It represents no specification. Whereas the levels one to four, syntax, semantics, action and purpose, represent increasingly higher levels of specification. And let's now just illustrate these four, these five information levels. So assume we have a piece of text of length L. So now the letters here are no longer amino acids, but uh, uh, letters of an ordinary alphabet, English in this example. And then I have, I will now give five examples of text of length 35 at the various information levels. So the first one is simply something that is complex. This is just gigerish, it's some random noise, but it's still complex because it's very difficult to generate exactly this sequence by chance if we try to do it once again. Uh, the next level is, has a correct syntax. We can recognize a word, but we we, we, th there is no specific meaning uh, of this sentence. Next sentence, it has a certain meaning. Uh, where, and, and whether this sentence is cor correct is... It, is it, it, well, I, I guess it depends on whether you speak about population or area. Uh, so, 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 but but it, it, it still, it, it, this sentence brings about meaning to, to, to a sender. Then level three get to the restaurant in two hours. Then the, 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 the sender 
uh, wants the receiver to act in a certain way and at the last level the uh, I will tell you something important that the sender also has a purpose of the message uh, so let's now uh, couple Wernigit's Gitt's five information levels to this definition of fine tuning so now omega there is the set of all texts of a certain length and now we have a specificity function with possible values 0, 1, 2, 3, 3 and 4 so for a given piece of text f of x tells how specified x is it could be complex, it could have the correct syntax, it could, have, it could bring about a meaning, uh, action or purpose and as let x ops be a piece of text of length n at a certain information level n. So if n is 4, we, we have a piece of text that also has a purpose, the highest level. I will tell you something important. Suppose we observe this sequence. Is that sequence fine-tuned? That is what we will ask. We want to find out whether this piece of text is fine-tuned. <coughs> And again, we go through this mathematical definition that requires three steps. Uh, step one, we need to find the set of texts that are at least as fine-tuned as the one we observe. And uh, if we observe uh, the sentence, I will tell you something important, it has the highest specificity level 4, then we'd go to the smallest set here, A4, the, P, the collection of all sets with uh, specificity level 4. But if we uh, observe the sentence come to the restaurant in two hours, then that is at information level 3. Then it's a slightly large, larger set, A3, and so on. So it depends, and, and here A, the A1 set is a set, set of all texts with information level, specificity level at least 1. And that was this, the text with correct words, but that sentence didn't have a meaning. But it could still be possible, very difficult to bring about even such a sentence by chance. <coughs> so, and then we need a distribution of a random... What do we mean by a randomly chosen piece of text? Well, the simplest thing is to say that the letters are independent, but we, we don't say that all letters are equally likely. We say that an E is more common than a, 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 a Q or, or something like that. We have a correct distribution of letters for that particular language. Uh, and then we compute the probability of the set AN. And then we can answer the question whether this uh, particular... Uh, it, well, how, how difficult it is by chance to obtain uh, this uh, piece of text that we observe. So, so, so now we have, I, I've given four applications of this definition of fine-tuning. We started with proteins, then we looked at uh, <coughs> molecular machines, then we looked at evolutionary trajectories, and now we looked at Werner Gitt's uh, five, uh, five levels of information. Now I will, I, I'm, I'm approaching the end of my talk, but I will also uh, talk a little bit about the concepts of functional and active information. Active information was introduced by Bob Marx and William Dembski uh, 15 years ago. And it's roughly speaking, if you have an algorithm uh, that sort of reaches a certain target much more easily than you would expect by chance, then uh, there is some intelligence that has been brought in from outside. So active information is a quantifies how much information that was brought in from outside. And as we will see, functional information is the same concept if, if, uh, uh, if uh, the algorithm is so smart that it with certainty reaches that target. So let's just uh, explain this. A, a, a bit more in detail. So let A be a set of highly specified states. 
and then we start with a randomized search, a random algorithm which sort of uh, totally randomly uh, walks around in this set omega for some time and then stops. Then it's quite unlikely that it will reach this this set A. Whereas Q is another algorithm that sort of is, is has some knowledge about the, the, the goal, the target. So it's sort, sort of it's a, a directed path. So it more easily reaches the set A. So some intelligence has brought in because in this in this algorithm knows about the target. So that means that the Q of A probability is a lot larger than for the random search. And then we can say that uh, the amount of active information the algorithm makes use of is the base 2 logarithm of the ratio between Q of A and P of A. So if, if uh, the algorithm is such that it doubles the probability of reaching the target, that is one bit of active information. Because it's a base 2 logarithm of 2, that is 1. If, uh, if, if the intelligent algorithm is such that it's four times as likely to reach the target, then there are two bits of information, and so on. Uh, if it's eight times as likely, then there are three bits of information. Uh, how much intelligence is brought in from outside. And in particular, if the algorithm is sort of super smart, that it brings about A with certainty, it always ends up in A, then uh, we, we can simply replace Q of A by 1 here. And that gives us the functional information. But then, actually, we can use functional information to define fine-tuning, because we said that an object is fine-tuned if the probability of this set A of highly specified states is small. That is the same thing as saying that the functional information is large. So that sort of gives us a connection between infused intelligence and fine-tuning, because I of F is large, that means that I of S quantifies how much external information is needed to reach the set with certainty for a super intelligent algorithm. And the structure is fine-tuned if the probability of A is small. That was our definition. That is the same thing as saying that a, a structure is fine-tuned if the functional information is large. If much external uh, information is needed for, for, for A to be reached. So, uh, and, and it's po also possible uh, to estimate active or functional estimation. So, suppose that we can repeat random search many times. So, the first random search ends up here, the second one here, the third one here. Then we can estimate P of A, simply the fraction of random searches ending up here. Then we repeat the, the intelligence algorithm many times. So, it will most of the times end up here, perhaps not always, but the estimate of Q of A is the fraction of, of, of random searches and ending up here. And uh, that means that P hat of A is the estimate of P of A, the probability to end up in the set A by chance, by having the fraction of, of simulations ending up there, and Q hat of A similarly is the estimate of the QA probability, the fraction of uh, replicates of the algorithm that ends up in the set A. Uh, so now we have estimates of P of A and Q and A, then we can estimate uh, active information by simply plugging in, replacing Q of, an a and Q of A and P of A by estimates. So that gives us an estimate of active information and that we can also estimate functional information. So that means that if we have replicates of something, we can estimate functional information and then we can also use that to draw the conclusion whether something is fine-tuned or not. So that brings me to summary and conclusions. Uh, I, I started defining uh, fine-tuning, saying that a structure is fine-tuned if it's complex, it has a low chance of occurring randomly, and it has an independent specification. And this is simply the definition of specified complexity. And then I said that fine-tuning can be quantified mathematically using 
probabilities of reaching by chance a state at least as specified as the observed structure. And that was the probability of the set A. And using this, this definition, I have argued that functioning proteins are fine-tuned, irreducibly, irreducibly complex molecular machines <coughs> are even more fine-tuned because that they are at the next level of hierarchy. Uh, and then I went to population genetics saying that if a population is old, it must be fine-tuned because, um, because of, since most mutations are slightly deleterious, time works against evolutionary theory. So blind evolution is not possible if the population is old. And then I, I, my fourth illustration was Vernon Gitt's four highest level of information. They correspond to increasingly higher amounts of fine-tuning because the corresponding sets are smaller and smaller. It's more difficult to, by chance to have to see a meaning with purpose, the highest level, than a meaning with the correct syntax for, inter, for instance. So, uh, and then I, I also uh, talked about the relation between fine-tuning and information. So I said that fine-tuning can equivalent, equivalently be described using functional information. Uh, an object is fine-tuned if the functional information is high. And this is, fine-tuning was the amount of external information an agent uses in order to bring about the fine-tuned structure with certainty. And an object is fine-tuned if its functional information is large. So you could say that functional information links fine-tuning to the concept of information and it, it links to fine-tuning to intelligence. I, I started this talk talking about these three levels, fine-tuning, design and God. So fine-tuning sort of brings us from fine-tuning to the next level design and how much information, how much intelligence is used to bring about the fine-tuned structure. So what does fine-tuning and functional uh, information ultimately point towards? Well, I think the answer is given in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, the first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, through him all things were made, without him nothing that nothing was made that has been possible. And let me end with some references. I have two papers with uh, Daniel Diaz and Robert Marx in Physics Journal on fine-tuning in cosmology. This is a paper I mentioned with Steina Tovalson on fine-tuning in biology and molecular machines. Then uh, uh, this is a follow-up paper I mentioned about where we, this one, where we sort of estimate uh, the amount of functional information and fine-tuning from simulations. This, I have not mentioned, talked about this paper, but I would like to mention that we use, now I've used functional information in order to uh, describe fine-tuning. In this paper, we sort of use functional information in order to quantify knowledge acquisition. So knowledge acquisition is more than learning, uh, because I, I, we have used the way philosophers define knowledge, justify true belief. So learning corresponds to justified uh, uh, true belief. But uh, uh, knowledge also requires that the, the true belief is, is, is uh, justified. And that's the reason why it goes beyond machine learning. So, thanks for your attention. Wenn Ihnen unser Video gefallen hat, dann können Sie uns auf drei Arten und Weisen unterstützen. Erstens Abo dalassen, Glocke aktivieren und Link teilen. Zweitens, ganz wichtig für unsere Arbeit, beten, dass wir das weitergeben, was Gott möchte. Oder drittens, Sie können auch spenden, denn unsere Arbeit ist spendenbasiert. Vielen herzlichen Dank.